a, a lot of people fantasize that we need to get off of Earth, abandon Earth, and go live on Mars. Well, unfortunately, wherever you go, there you are. So even though I think it will be completely impossible to have any kind of viable human existence, I mean, I mean, maybe people could be alive in those places, but to have a viable human existence on a non-living planet, because we think that the living planet is dying, why, why would you go to a dead planet if you think your problem is that the living planet is dying? Why not keep the living planet alive? This thinking is literally psychotic, but that's the teaching that we have been raised with, that the world doesn't matter. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political, and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Carl Safina. Carl is an ecologist and a nature writer, and his most recent book, Alfie and Me, What Owls Know, What Humans Believe, was released last October. This is Carl's second time on Planet Critical, and I was so happy to speak with him again because that first conversation, which I will link, was so foundational to a lot of my thinking in the years that Planet Critical has been developing. Funnily enough, that first conversation was about this book, but while he was in the process of researching and writing it. And he joins me today to discuss his findings that in the heart of ancient Greece over 2000 years ago, humankind split apart from nature. One man believed in a perfect place, an eternal place made by a single fabricator. And thus the idea of the material realm being profane, being bad, being evil, and being not a fit home for our eternal souls was born. This is Plato and his theory of absolute ideals. And Carl walks us through the impact that that one philosophy has had on the entirety of the world, explaining how all over the world, there were many different cultures, rich in their diversity, but at the heart of it was this understanding that we are all connected to one another in some shape or form, spiritually and materially. And yet the consequence of one man's idea, this dualism, spawned what Carl goes on to describe in the episode as hell on earth. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Carl, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to be back. Now, uh, last time we had just such a fascinating general conversation that really forged a lot of my thinking going forward. I really sort of depended on that conversation. So I hope we're going to have just as rich a one again, as I'm sure we will. I'm sure. <laughs> and to launch us there, my first question for you is, why is the world in crisis? Well, there are so many different crises, mm. but... If we talk about the environment and nature and just leave out all the other terrible things that are going on right now with uh, politics and conflict and everything like that, but just in terms of the environment, we have what people are calling a poly crisis. We have the climate crisis, we have the toxics crisis, we have the extinction crisis, the plastics crisis, um, all of this driven by the combination of 8 billion of us and a desire on the part of almost everybody to 
live uh, a more material life, to have more things that use more energy. Um, and, you know, at the root of this, what I really see is that we don't operate as if we are connected to the rest of the living world, to other living things and to the life supporting systems that made us possible and, and keep us possible on this planet. So I asked myself a question, um, about a year ago in the course of writing uh, my most recent book. And the question was, is our blindness to all the things that live around us and our disconnect from how things live, is that just a natural consequence of the human mind? Is it just a limitation that we have? Or is it something that we're actually taught? And um, to try to answer that question about what we are taught, I looked into what people were taught in other cultures traditionally before our economy globalized and the world westernized. But to try to get a sense of the flavor of teaching on, on this point in other cultures. So I, I looked at indigenous cultures which are extremely diverse, but they have one really general um, commonality, and that is that most of them, maybe all of them, see the world as a, a thing that we are all intimately related to, that they um, have viewed other creatures as um, essentially soulmates or literally soulmates that, that have, uh, equivalent souls that, um, are related to us that have agency. Uh, in fact, all of, all of those things, you know, ironically enough, or, or maybe not surprisingly, these ancient it intuitions turn out to be true. Um, many other animals have agency and they, and we are all literally one related family of life. And I, I looked at South Asian religions, the Dharmic religions that um, believe in a karmic wheel of reincarnation, not that humans are the only thing that matter and that only humans have a soul, but that everything has a soul, that all of the holy things and all of the sacred things are in this world. The world is always material and spirit at the same time. Which I guess in modern, in terms of modern physics, the world is matter and energy at the same time, and those things change into one another. Then I looked at East Asian religions, and the focus there was also on how everything is related, with uh, emphasis uh, on the human role in in um, keeping the balances in the world that keep the world whole. So we should not upset the balances. And then I looked at our culture, the Western culture, about 2000 years ago in ancient Greece, a very different story took hold. And that story is that humans are the only thing that matter, that the whole world is here for us, for us to use. We have no responsibilities to the world. It's here to give us anything we want. And that view, even in its time, it had its critics, but it managed to take hold. It was brought into Judaism and especially Christianity and became the major way that we look at the world. Plato said that the world is a, is a very imperfect place full of suffering and decay. And he had his ideas that perfection existed outside of space and time. And this created a split, not a unity, not a balance, but a split between the ideal that he imagined and the real that he denigrated. He did not like the material world. And, and this became the way that our religions have, have looked at things, that the material world is not a holy place or a sacred place. It's not even important. The important thing is to focus on 
what will happen after we die to get ready to die to to try to be prepared to go to heaven rather than the idea that the world is uh is the sacred place is the holy place is what made us possible to begin with and is what can keep us going if we don't wreck it but we are taking apart the stability of the world and the life supporting systems and along with that we are taking down almost all of the other living things right now 70 percent of all the birds in the world are chickens and 96 percent of all the mammals in the world are humans and our livestock basically humans cows and pigs wild mammals are only four percent of all the mammals in the world at this point in time and we don't tend to know these things we don't see it as the calamity that it is because we are not taught anything about our connectedness in fact when we get handed our diploma and we're told congratulations you've graduated we don't know where our food comes from where our water comes from where our energy comes from or how it's created we don't know where any of the material that we get and use comes from we know one thing when we get our diploma and that is we know how to buy things we have been made into consumers not citizens not even people we've been made consumers and that's our education a total disconnect from all of our consequences in the world a, a lot of people fantasize that we need to get off of earth abandon earth and go live on mars well unfortunately wherever you go there you are so even though i think it will be completely impossible to have any kind of viable human existence i mean i mean maybe people could be alive in those places but to have a viable human existence on a non-living planet because we think that the living planet is dying why, why would you go to a dead planet if you think your problem is that the living planet is dying why not keep the living planet alive this thinking is literally psychotic but that's the teaching that we have been raised with that the world doesn't matter yeah and it's a catastrophe yeah totally i think um the whole let's go colonize mars thing reveals the real cognitive dissonance like the lack of understanding and i find it quite fascinating as well for all of that money and r and d and engineering and tech to be thrust into that domain and field of research when actually it's fundamentally lacking the main thing that we all need to learn, which you've been describing, which is that we cannot survive on our own. We are not built to, and we shouldn't. I think that the word you used was viable life. God, imagine that discussing the human experience in terms of viability rather than fulfillment or satisfaction. It just goes to show how how lost we are <laughs> well i mean i'm all for fulfillment and satisfaction i i, I mm -hmm. try to achieve that all the time but but not by having more and going faster and being bigger you know that's that kind of a treadmill um you, you know i mean that's the uh what what's what's the character from um uh oh geez now i'm forgetting I'm forgetting the whole the whole story. Uh, Al Alice in Wonderland. What's the mm -hmm. the queen the queen on the treadmill that has to keep going faster and faster to keep up? Is it the queen who does? Anyway, I mean that's the allegory <laughs> for our our whole approach to to life is to think that you you can only feel satisfied by by constantly speeding up the treadmill, um, and and you know just we're constantly bombarded with the idea that we don't have enough, that we're not good enough, that we don't look well enough. Uh, and it, that's all because people only value us if we buy things from them. Yeah. Can we take it back to Plato quickly? Um, 
what happened? How is it? Do we do we have an understanding of how this popped up in ancient Greece in the West when it didn't in other cultures? Um, I don't exactly know why Plato was so disparaging of the material world. There was a long history of Greek thought before that. There were lots of Greek gods and goddesses, and they were always having sort of a human soap opera somewhere outside the world with, you know, jealousies and revenge and all, all of this kind of stuff. And then there were philosophers who said, you know, that's really silly. Let's try to figure out how things really work. And uh, they were the leading edge. Really, they invented free inquiry, the, the idea that you're trying to actually understand how things work, which is the root approach, I guess, to science. Um, but Plato had this idea that thinking is really the most incredible thing. And of course, there was nothing for thousands of years, there were, there were no way, there was no way to test any of these ideas because the scientific method and experimentation was not around. They didn't have microscopes to even see where thinking arises. Like now we have, you know, neurobiology and brain science, but you know, thousands of years ago, they had nothing. There were people thousands of years ago developing atomic theory just by thinking that everything seems to be made of smaller things. There must be the smallest thing and we can't see it. And so the smallest things make everything, but we can't detect them in any way. So our senses are no good to detect reality. The, these, these ideas of atomic theory were, were not wrong. They were um, rudimentarily true, but there was no way to test them for something like 2,000 years. And so all these ideas were swirling all around. And, and um, Plato was saying, well, how is it that we think and, and isn't thinking the purest thing because somehow it happens? How does it happen? It, it must be, you know, it was sort of a, it became like a mystical sort of a question with a mystical sort of an answer and drawing from other things that people were talking about, about the existence of souls. There was this idea that at birth, a soul enters the body and becomes trapped in the body and, and yearns only to get out of the body, which it only gets out of at death. Why people would think a soul would go in and get trapped, I, I don't know. I don't know, you know, how that seemed logical to them. But, but these ideas were sort of swirling around. And it seems to me from what I've been reading that Plato was trying to make some sense of all of these ideas. The idea that we, we think and that we can imagine things that don't really exist. Like, you know, there's this idea of a platonic relationship that goes back to Plato. And what is that? What does that imply? It, 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 what it really means is perfect love. Plato had this idea that we can imagine perfection. We can imagine perfect love. We can imagine a perfect circle. We can imagine a, a perfect, let's just say you're a carpenter trying to make a table. You can imagine a perfect scroll that you want to carve into the wood. It never really turns out perfect. So Plato was saying, well, how can we imagine something that doesn't exist? It must be that perfection does exist, but it's not here. There's nothing here that's perfect. So it must exist somewhere else. And our ability to imagine it must come from these eternal souls that are in us. He, he, he seemed to think that it was the soul that does the thinking because he didn't know anything about 
brains or how, how brains are working or anything. So the soul must be doing the thinking and it, and it can imagine perfection because it in its eternal life has had contact with perfection in a perfect place, which is certainly not here. This place is not perfect. So a perfect place must exist somewhere. And he thought that the perfect place was made by a fabricator, uh, which, which he gave a Greek name to. So, so now we have for the first time that there's one creator hmm. creating a perfect place that an eternal soul yearns to get to. And these ideas were brought into the religious traditions of Judaism. And as I said, they really later served the development of Christian theology, where the Christian theologians were literally quoting Plato in their writings. So there were, there were other Greeks at the time and later who said Plato is all wrong. I mean, this is nuts. He's just fantasizing. But they did not carry the day or the centuries or the millennia. It was the, it was the, um, it, the, the transferring of Plato's ideas into the developing Western religious tradition. And then, of course, you had the Inquisition for 800 years, where if you dared to believe or publicly say anything different, uh, you were in for, at worst, a very rough treatment, and, um, and many, many thousands of people were simply killed on the basis of heresy for saying that they didn't think that what they were told was right, was true, was actually how it is. And, and, and many of those murders were, were actually of theologians, you know, and, and this is, this is why, um, the Protestant reformation was, was centuries in, in coming and was such a gigantic deal at the time, not, not so much because it was just different thinking, but that, um, you know, that it, it kind of marked the the end of the power of the inquisition and certainly of the of this the one catholic church where where and this is totally different than the way it was in south asia where you have all these different religions many of them are are quite related i mean in the west are are three western religions judaism christianity and islam they are all quite related and they and they believe a whole bunch of foundational things that come from the same source but um, but then we fight and kill each other over what we think is different. In, in South Asia, there was essentially none of that. With all, all the different Dharmic religions, people would say, "No, I don't think it's that way. I think it's this way," and and they would, you know, argue about what way they thought it really was. But it wasn't. It, it there wasn't the suppression, the the gigantic institutionalization, or or anything like that kind of violence traditionally in those religions. What's fascinating, I mean, it's all fascinating, but what's particularly fascinating for me is you can almost hear the the beginning as well of individualism, I think, in Plato's thoughts. Um, because if you were to take, if you were to go Eastern into these other traditions, like the Tao, for example, or Zen, there's this concept of like the the bigger picture of things being true and false at the same time and unable un a human mind unable to grasp it all at once um and thus a sense of like the entirety of the thing is perfect even if individually when you break it down into the smallest yeah. bits it is made of life and decay and suffering and joy and all of these things and for plato i mean even the concept that like the perfect place must be able to be held in a human mind is such a staggeringly arrogant thought, I would say. Um, and then also it means that it must be able to be held in the mind of each individual mind. And thus the split happens as well with the perfect place. Well, the must split, be, yeah, Plato, Plato's split between the, the real and the ideal and between perfection and the earth is really thorough. It's, it, it becomes everything. It, it becomes, uh, 
you know, man against nature. And then, and, and in even saying that, that way, it implies man against woman. It's, mm-hmm. it's me against you. It's us versus them. Mm-hmm. And, and the splitting is called dualism. Whereas in the East, as you said very well, the diversity of the world was necessary for the unity of the world. This is the sort of the yin yang um, idea where you cannot have happy without sad, up without down, forward without back, hot without cold, old without young. All of the opposites were necessary to make up the whole. And, and Plato thought the opposites were opposing. And that is the dualism mm. with which uh, everything about us is like a struggle of something against something else. In many traditional societies, the idea of being a, a great individual came from what you did for your community. A great individual helped make a great community, and a great community made strong and great people. Everything was done with the whole in mind and with the community foremost, and, and even thinking about coming generations. In, uh, in North America, for instance, very, very famously, there's this common idea among indigenous people that that all decisions need to keep seven generations in mind and um and i've actually read uh, two different things about what that means a lot of people think it means seven generations from now i I, it makes more sense to me that the seven generations are the seven that we can experience from our great great grandparents Mm. grandparents parents, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that everybody's interests should be kept in mind for every decision. And we have nothing like that. Now, one of the biggest problems in modernity is that while the, uh, while the Inquisition was at its most powerful, the, the, inklings of modern science were being developed and and so the approach to science and the approach to technology that that then became the industrial the industrial revolution and modern science were heavily influenced by the values that that say that the world does not matter and that you don't have to keep the world in mind that everything is here to serve us and uh and unfortunately you know these values um well put another way all technology delivers on the values that sent it (laughs) so if we valued the world and other beings and the stability of life support systems when we thought about doing some major thing we would keep all of it in mind instead of none of it in mind one little example might uh simply be that um instead of the approach to development that creates the habitat fragmentation that is one of the reasons that populations of most uh, wild animals are in such steep decline. And instead of just fragmenting everything, making sure that as we develop, we, we leave corridors and connection and that there is, you know, enough to keep it all going. But we, but, but we, we just don't think that way because we have not been taught to think that way. And, And we've been taught you know, we, in a sense, we're taught not to think that way. I had Laura Martin on the show recently, who was talking about um, the problem with the conserve 30% of Earth's surface by 2030. That plan um, is because it, it fulfills this fragmentation again. And it suggests, well, there's a binary, then there's these like wild, safe places and these sacrificed places where um, other species will be destroyed and also where human beings will have to live. And again, this continued dualism of mankind versus nature. 
that mankind is not meant to exist in wild spaces and wild spaces are meant to be kept away from us. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in that, but, but at the way it's going, I, I think 30% is looking pretty good right now compared to, compared to the way that it's headed. Um, and, and that is, that is at least an attempt to keep all the other components in mind. But, um, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so what do we do? Because I think another interesting point about this is the obvious, uh, result that a culture that does not care about its current environment, that feels totally, um, welcome to abuse it, to abuse other living things, to abuse fellow members of its species. That has sort of won the cultural war, you could imagine. It is the Western culture that has been exported um, in globalization. Um, because cultures that are inherently more caring, more careful, uh, more connected to the world will not be willing to use, and I'm generalizing here, but I'm, you know, I would say probably not as willing to use as much violence um, when combating this sort of great force. So, so what do we do? Because it needs to unpick so many layers, like the consumption, the individualism, the ideology of it. Yes. Well, we need it. We need a, a, a new set of values, which actually is probably the oldest set of values and need to apply those values into our modern existence and the way we move forward from here. Just one small example is last summer, I received a frantic phone call from my stepdaughter saying, I I'm, I'm up, I'm upstairs and I think the house is on fire because I only see, I can see a lot of smoke outside. And I said, I'm really sorry to tell you that our house is not what is burning. What's burning is Canada. Wow. And the Amazon and, and the Western United States and Australia. But what was burning was Canada. And that's why we were having trouble breathing. And that's why when the sky should have been blue in the summer with a big yellow sun, we could hardly see the sun. And I was thinking about what about all these birds, all, all these aerobic Olympians trying to feed their babies in air that's hurting me to breathe are, 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 is everything dying in their nest? What, what, what's going on with this? But the, but the other thing about that is that in the United States, we have the clean air act, which, uh, was enacted in the 1970s and made a huge difference in cleaning up air pollution and and now is completely beside the point the clean air act is totally useless and impotent against the the burning that's going on meanwhile um what has been the most efficient way of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is trees and what's burning is trees because what are we investing in instead? We're investing in trying to develop machinery to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And meanwhile, the clean tech companies are struggling because, because people are not investing in them because all the profits are with the oil companies who are posting record profits in the last couple of years and announcing new mergers and, and new investments in new drilling while they have zero responsibility for the fact that the continent is on fire, we, we have a culture of rights or people have been trying for centuries to get their basic human rights. And in the U S we have the bill of rights. There's the UN declaration of human rights, but there's no flip side that is ever discussed. There's no bill of responsibilities. There's no declaration of rights and responsibilities. So the companies that are making the problem, they get the subsidies. The solutions are starved for money. We have very little option in how we live. And all of that is, is because we, we value the actual world at zero 
but the problems that are constantly perpetuating themselves. I mean, you can't solve problems if, if your system keeps perpetuating the same problem. And those problems keep getting rewarded more than anything else. And they use some of that profit reward to limit the options that can possibly be developed. And, and, and our governments subsidize them to do that because their lobbyists get the government to buy, basically buy the government and get them to do that. So the, the system is very, very broken. And we're, and we're just talking about energy as one thing there. We can talk about food as another thing, a completely broken way of doing things, killing the soil, polluting the air and water at the same time, killing off so many insects. I mean, the difference in insects in my lifetime is unbelievable. Often at night, the street lights, which used to be filled with insects and, and bats flying through them, there are no bugs in the street lights anymore in the summertime where I live. Sometimes none at all. And, and what do all the birds feed their young ones, even birds that eat seeds a lot of the year, they feed their young ones insects. So what, why are all these insects gone? They're gone mostly because of all the pesticides that are applied all over the place, in, in, including people who they, they're not thinking about anything else because they're never taught in their lifetime to think about anything else. And they're drenching their properties with insecticides. Our farms are drenching the landscape with insecticides. The soil is dead. The, the water is polluted. It's a, a, so that's another broken system that's broken by the fact that we place zero value on the world, on the living community, on the consequences. What do you think about this proposal to place a financial value on the living world and the natural world uh, so as to stop the externalization, quote unquote, of these costs? There's now a biodiversity framework uh, going through the European Union, for example, that essentially they're going to put a price on nature. And if you want to destroy nature or harm nature in any way, you're going to have to pay for it. What do you think about that? Well, the, I think the first time I heard this concept was with the phrase polluter pays. Hmm. So, you know, the idea is if, if you're going to pollute you part, you know, part of the operating cost of the business is the cost of the pollution and basically the cost of cleaning it up or, or preventing it, that you have responsibility to prevent it or to clean it up. Uh, I think I first heard that about 40 years ago, 45 years ago, it has made a little progress. And like many things that are crucially needed, it's made only a little progress, but it is crucially needed because how can you, po I mean, we can't possibly continue on this path, which is causing all of this dying and all of this destabilization. It's the result of, of the thinking that you have a right to pollute and, and no responsibility to clean it up. So yes, this is absolutely crucial. What, that's what I think of it. But the whole system is, is rigged so differently that it almost seems bizarre to say that you're responsible for what you do. <laughs> yeah. I think I worry about the financialization of such um, programs as well, because there are companies that can afford it. And essentially it says, well, if you can pay for it, then it's absolutely fine. So the value still lies in totally in the dollar. And well, that's one way of looking at it, that it's totally fine as if, if you're just being fined for it and that's all. But, uh, you know, I, I would say that you, you are, you should be required not to. And mm -hmm. you can't say, well, it's too expensive not to, because it's much too expensive to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's very revealing when you look at the stats on the subsidies, even just the energy companies. If you, and if you took away all of the subsidies in the world, we would be in negative growth 
uh, negative global GDP, which is what everybody is so obsessed with keeping. And yet it is, you know, uh, artificially inflated because these companies are A, not doing any good for the natural world, for our economies, um, and not actually providing the service that allegedly they're meant to, which is, you know, continued financial growth. Well, I mean, first of all, all, all of these values are entirely made up and money yep. is a fake thing that we make up. So uh, what any of this is valued at, it only reflects our valuation of things. And it could be anything that we decided it, it was. And growth only, only means to make things bigger. Mm -hmm. Growth is the obsession because there are a lot of people who, you know, we have this system of investing in the stock markets where you, you, you don't do any work and you hope to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only reason that growth makes any sense as a goal. The only other thing that has growth as its only goal is a cancer cell. There's Growth does not mean making things better. Improvement means making things better. Growth means making things bigger, and bigger and better are two different things. Sometimes it's better to be bigger. Sometimes it's better to be focused and smaller. Better health, better education, better communities, they don't rely on growth. They rely on improvement, and they rely on justice. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, though, um, I mean, obviously, I'm completely uh, with you on um, the anti-growth train. I suppose an argument in a geopolitically tense, warmongering world would be that bigger is better because then you are on the top of the heap. Well, what does it mean to be on the top of the heap? It, it means that you have more killing power. That's what it means, you know, bigger... A, a big, you know, a look at the, uh, the, the so-called, you know, well, the military budget of the U S is, uh, is an obscenity and the, uh, and, and the amount of money that we pay to keep people in prison is an obscenity as well. Yeah. 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 I, that's, that's one of the reasons that the, that the biggest countries are are, are horrible in so many ways that have to do with, you know, simply human rights. Sorry, can you explain that for me? Well, just look at them. Look, look at China, look at Russia, look at the U S the, the U S has the, the highest incarceration rate of any country. And, and, uh, we're, we're able to just send bombs anywhere look, uh, you know, China is obsessed with controlling everything about its citizens. Russia is waging wars every now and then that are completely unnecessary uh, on, on, in every single possible way you look at them. They're, they're the work of a, of a mad person. And, uh, that would not be possible if, you know, Belgium can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So bigger, all, bigger has a lot of downsides, a lot of downsides, and, and a lot of them have to do with the most important things, peace and human dignity. Mm. And where in your research, where would you say that peace and dignity, where in the world are pockets of these kinds of cultures still found? Everywhere. Everywhere. Um, there are pockets. And peace is always trying to break out and, and it, it has to do mainly with stability and, um, and the absence of dualism, the, the absence of saying that I am different from you, because mm. that's the beginning of, of these problems, these little, little differences that are magnified into uh, into hell on earth, which, which is the, the wars that are waged over nothing at all. It's quite a departure from Plato's absolute ideals, in a sense, isn't it? That he thought a perfect place could exist, and yet it was following that line of thought that created hell on earth. 
Yeah, I never thought of it that way, and that's a that's a pretty remarkable statement. But I I think that uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of truth in that. <laughs> However, um, Plato was not a fan of democracy. Plato thought that there were certain people who should rule, and that's one of the reasons that uh, he was very very much loved and admired by the monarchs of Europe and and even by the modern Chinese government. Uh, so there should be a ruling class. Yes. Mm. It's funny, when you were talking about his theory at the beginning, one of the things that came to mind was it, it's a kind of um, philosophy that could only come out of an unequal and hierarchical society. Um, of course. Yes. And so... I, I don't know. And I mean, what the other societies that you looked at around about that time, what did they look like? Were they also more equal, less hierarchical, um, better treatment of women? <laughs> well, you know, for, first of all, I don't exactly know because in my, in my um, research into this, I was really focused only on the view of the human place in the world um, or and in the cosmos, you know, the human place in, in the scheme of things. Um, and some of those who have wonderful things to say about the human place in the scheme of things um, have some very obviously hideous beliefs about humans in relation to other humans. Mm. Uh, for instance, Hinduism has a, a just a really lovely, lovely way of talking about the network of relationships that exist throughout the world and throughout the cosmos, that everything is related, everything reflects everything else, and, and yet they have the caste system, which mm -hmm. is hideous. So um, I don't think that it's helpful to say, well, they believe these good things, but look at the horrible things that they do, mm -hmm. because then you're just paralyzed with, okay, nothing, nothing's really any good. Everything is uh, cynical. I, I think it's worth saying there's an aspect to these teachings that would result in something really fantastic if we could amplify it. And there's an aspect in these other teachings that is really fantastic if we could amplify it. And we could select, you know, from all of the different thoughts that have occurred to people over the, well, the, 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 the millennia and take the best ideas. There are some very good ideas and there are some terrible ideas. And, and of course, in any, in any culture, you had a, a whole variety of thinkers. It wasn't just one culture has one idea. It's interesting, though, because if you were to pick and mix, which I love as an idea, you're essentially asking people to shed a belief system and for that to evolve into something else as well. Because all of these ideologies are predicated on it, the entirety. You have to follow the entirety of it and believe the entirety of it in order to adhere correctly. And so to say we're going to take this and that, we're going to leave that, and we're going to mix it all together. I don't know. I never thought about it before, but it does something yeah. to our relationship with belief as well. Well, I think in no belief system does everybody believe everything. Um. You know, let's just say in Christianity, there are evangelical Christians who cannot wait for the world to end hmm. because at the end of the Bible, it says that this earth will be, re will pass and be replaced by a better world. But this world has to end completely before that happens. And then everybody who's good gets to go to heaven. I mean, they, all the signs that the, that the world is coming apart, they love. But there are other evangelical Christians who are trying to elevate the idea of creation care that think that, well, 
everything that we see around us was made by the God that we worship. And we have to take care of his creation and not destroy his creation. And, and that's what they believe. They, they're a minority right now, but you know, they find those beliefs in the same, in the same text that people find the opposite beliefs. It depends on what you emphasize and what you amplify. And what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm. Which is really what all of it is to begin with. Right. Tell me, Carl, when is your book out where we can read all of this in great detail? It is one month and three days old already. Oh, my So uh, it came out on October 3rd, 2023. Excellent. I will link that in the show notes for everyone. And that book is built around a very sweet story of a rescued baby owl who prompted me into all of this research uh, by making me wonder why it is that we don't see the emotional uh, capacities of all of the other animals around us and how they live and how they, you know, operate in the world. Um, we, we, mostly we don't see them at all. And when we do see them, we just think of them as scenery. We don't, we don't ask what, what do they feel? What, what do they need? Um, and I was wondering why it is that we don't see it and did anybody else ever see it in the history of the world? So that's why we got into all this stuff we're talking about. The book is based on, on, uh, how the story of raising this owl, um, gets me into those kinds of questions. That is absolutely beautiful. And where is the owl now? Rescued yeah, in the she's, wild? She's, she's right over there in a tree sleeping. She's been free living for um, more than four years now. She has raised 10 young owls and put them out into the world. Um, she has a wild mate. And even though she is a fully functioning, free living owl, she her her trust in us continues to be complete and whole and uh, we see her almost every day and she centered her territory right around our backyard after she disappeared for about a week and then decided that I, our backyard is a pretty good place she's <laughs> never left oh god that's so lovely thank you so much my final question for you is who would you like to platform Oh uh, yeah, I think um maybe Melanie Challenger would be an interesting person for you to talk to and you can certainly tell her that I suggested her. Okay, excellent. I'll reach out to her. Carl, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.